So my parents are from the Caribbean. They're from Montserrat, which is by Antigua, mm. you know, all of that, all of that. And uh, and uh, they got married in London. I was born there. And then the day after, literally the day after I was born, they had one of the uh, in Notting Hill. They had one of the biggest race riots in in the city. Really? They had a massive one. It was literally. I was born August twenty second. That sit that conflict was on August twenty third, and that made my parents go, okay. Because this is the time of the Teddy Boys, you know, kind of kind of rockabilly, rockabilly, mm. rockabilly racists. <laughs> rockabilly know. racists. Yeah, there was there was a whole thing like after World War Two, you know, the, they brought in people from India, they brought people from parts of Africa like Nigeria, they brought people from Jamaica and o- other English parts of the West Indies to help rebuild London because all right. of these cities had been blown up by the Blitz. Right. So they brought people in, and um, and quickly there were a lot of resentment from people that were there, but they brought in folks to kind of because you know the cities had been destroyed, and uh, yeah, so it got it got it got weird. So you guys got out of there and went to my uh, parents got my parents got out. My pop said, you know what, I'm gonna take a chance on America. And um, first we lived in Harlem for for a I don't know it was a maybe a month and then he said I'm gonna go to Brooklyn he just went to Brooklyn instead so Brooklyn is what I know I grew up in Brooklyn and wow, I, I didn't go like? I didn't well you know it was fantastic I mean when I think about it I love it um it was a it was a fascinating time because you know I mean I was born at the end of the 50s mm. so so you know, you still saw cars from the 1930s. When I was a little kid, you still saw cars from the 40s and the and the 30s on the street. And then then all the kind of cars with the fins, the Cadillacs with the fins. Yeah. Then you started seeing the muscle cars, which is like incredible. You know, like seeing you know the Corvettes and seeing the Mustangs and the Cougars yeah. and things like that. So it was a very it, it was a very dynamic time. A lot of change has happened in a very short period of time. Like I was a, a literally a child in the 60s, a little kid, and the things were incredible, you know. So like the moon landing, I mean everything, I you know, I saw um, Jack Ruby shoot Lee Harvey Oswald on live TV. What? Yeah, my wow. parents, my parents, and my parents are young, you know. They were they were just in their early 20s and what have you, and they said, that's the guy, and, and the, they, he was being brought in for his arraignment. And my dad said, you know, that's that's the guy that shot the president. And as, as soon as he said that, you just saw this fedora come into the frame and pop, 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 and it was pandemonium. It was freak, freak, freaky. So so all that early media exposure had a, had a big, had a big uh, impact on me, like seeing civil rights um, protests, seeing Bull Connor, the dogs, the hoses, you know, that kind of really imprinted on me, you know, cause I could, I could see, I could see who the, who the hoses were being turned on right. and I could look at my arm and go, oops, you know, so yeah, pretty much. But it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was an amazing time. It was a weird, cool things, you know, cause also being exposed to things that I don't, you know, I'm a kid, right? But seeing King Kong and Dracula and, you know, James Wales, Frankenstein, you know, seeing all that stuff had a really huge impact. That, that, was, that was a cinema that, that really impacted me. And how old were you when you first got into music? I, you know, I was into music, I think, from when I first heard it, but I didn't play an instrument until I was a teenager. And where you, was your first... The first music you got into was it rock and roll? First music I heard, well, the first music I heard was like Motown mm. and British Invasion. It was kind of almost a split between Motown, Stax, mm. James Brown, and the British Invasion bands, and then the bands from San Francisco and things like that. So it was like hearing, I mean, hearing BB King, early, hearing early rock and roll because they were playing. Because at that time they were being played as almost um, 
they were being played as oldies, right? So, but for me, it's brand new, right? right? Well, I remember hearing, I mean, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, hearing Dionne Warwick. Dionne Warwick had a huge impact on me. That You know, Burt Bacharach just, Burt Bacharach just passed. And hearing Dionne Warwick, you know, do you know the way to San Jose and anyone who had a heart and a house is not a home, all those tunes. You know? mm. She had such a incredibly, incredible voice, you know. <laughs> So how does such a, a legendary musician like yourself become so interested in such an expert in artificial intelligence? Well, I don't know if I'm that much of an expert, but I, but I have an interest in it because I think science fiction, science fiction in a way had a huge impact on me, as I said, you know, horror and then science fiction. And then we've been, we've had this kind of fascination with the idea of the supercomputer um, Colossus, the Forbin Project, HAL 9000 from 2001. Um, I mean, what was it? Knight Rider, the car, the car kit, you know, the car that talked to the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, mm -hmm. the car that talked, you know. We've had this fascination with it going, and I'm probably skipping a bunch of stuff. I mean, silent running, you know, the robotics, you know, the robot from Lost in Space, you know, the robot from from Forbidden Planet. We've had a fascination with this technology going back, I mean, much longer than that, even, you know, even folklore, it's been a thing. So, mm -hmm. so you know, the idea of technology having a kind of life of its own, even if you think about something like a music box, right? You know, you turn the thing and it plays a tune. Well, mm -hmm. a, a music box is a kind of sequencer. Right. You know, or play a piano, you know, with right. the, the piano seems to play itself. You have a roll and and it automates the keys. And that be, that was like a, whole, a huge craze, the player piano. In fact, there was a Mexican composer, Conlon Nancaro. And you should, if you hear, if you get a chance, listen to Conlon Nancaro's music. He, he, do, he did this thing where he took piano rolls and he made impossible, impossible piano pieces. He made these pieces for player piano that were, would be impossible for a human being to play. Incredibly fast, incredibly mm. dense, really out there, really entertaining. And, and he was, a, 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 you know, just a, a, a pioneer of the idea mm. of mm, not exactly electronics, but using mechanical means, you know. Right. To, so we've had a fascination with automata, for the longest time and the idea of intelligence uh, uh the box that speaks and things the oracle we've had a you know a fascination with it and now we're finally at a place even think about movies movies would portray computers that didn't exist i mean computers that would be were faster and more reliable than computers were actually available you know, so we've had this idea and now finally we're getting to a place where not just personal computers, but our phones, our, our tablets have a lot of capabilities. And, um, you know, this this whole idea of the, the computer that could be the human being at chess. Right. Right. That was a that was a big deal. And then it didn't stop there. It's like now there's a computer that beat human beings playing Go, which is a game much more complex than chess. The, you know, the computer that beat the Jeopardy, you know. So this, this whole idea has been just a fascination. And to what end, to what, I mean, really to what, to what end. And now we're starting to see things that we only saw in sci-fi books and movies. We're starting to see those kind of things. And now it's starting to get us a little nervous. Have you always thought deeply about this kind of stuff since you were a kid, or has this been something like yeah, that, watching robot. movies earlier? Or is this absolutely, something? Abs absolutely? I mean, I, again, you know, I um, I was fascinated by the moon landing. I was fascinated, and then turned turned to find out I didn't know that you know they had the movie Hidden Figures that there were these African American female mathematicians that were you know they helped, they actually were essential in plotting how the you know the trajectories for the for the um, mercury for the space capsule mm -hmm. 
saying that wrong. Wow. <laughs> but and then and then I learned about Ed Dwight. You know, Ed Dwight was in the Mercury program. Ed Dwight was in the Mercury program. There's one um, African American astronaut in the program, and uh, and he wasn't allowed to fly. It's a whole thing. He was kind of hounded out of the program by Chuck Yeager. You think when you watch movies that the movies get their inspiration from like what is real, right? They, you think that when you watch something in some sort of crazy mm -hmm. sci-fi film, people are going into space and going to different planets, mm -hmm. that this is all based on something that could that's already has potential in the real world. But if you dig into it, it seems like there's evidence for, especially when it comes to the defense department and things like that. Like some of our most groundbreaking science comes from the inspiration of, of war and, and global mm -hmm. control. You know, they call it blue sky research where it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, here's some crazy science fiction, fantastical idea. Mm -hmm. How could we make this a reality? And there's people out there that are actually doing that, like doing it that way. They're trying to get to it. It's, it's funny. We come up because most science fiction is actually fantasy. Most science fiction I mean, something like when you hear about things like the FTL drive, which is, you know, faster than light travel, you know, faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So the idea of getting something, the mass of a starship to travel faster than the speed of light, it's one of those things that is incredibly entertaining mm -hmm. and it's wonderful to see it, you know. We're going to go to warp speed. It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But if you stop and think about that for any length of time, I mean... The speed of light is like a hard limit. Like it took a long time for us to go faster than the speed of sound. And to go faster than the speed of sound, I mean, there are effects. Like you can't do for a sustained, like a pilot can't do it for a super sustained right. period. I right. mean, like this, we, we get into the problem of G-forces and the effect that G-forces have on mm -hmm. the human body. You know, there, there, there are real issues about, you know, we evolved on a planet with gravity. So the idea of being in space without gravity for extended periods of time is a problem. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. That's why the, the astronauts have to use treadmills. They have to exercise. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not like just about being in shape. It's yeah. literally in order for them to stay healthy in a weightless environment, they have to you know, they have to work on their bone density. They have to keep their muscle mass mm. or they're just gonna have problems. So if you think about extended time periods you know, that's going to be an issue. The idea, the idea of cryogenic, a cryogenic change. You're going to be frozen, and right. we're going to fly. It's going to be a hundred years, and you're going to, you know, da, da, da. and it's like, you know, I, tissue, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if our tissues. I don't know if freezing our tissues. I don't know how it's going to work. How's right. the defrost going to work? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know how it is when the when the when the fish defrost at a. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's 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 an actual thing that would have to be worked out and we do not and in fact, interestingly enough, maybe the only way we're going to work out these issues, we have to have a, a a form of calculation, intelligence if you will, a form of brute force calculation that has a certain amount of creativity or to do it. We we're not going to I don't think we're just going to do it with um, just a bunch of smart people figuring out the thing that's happening in a way. And this is jumping the shark a bit. Yeah. About about it's really language model, the large language model generative AI, because people are very particular about calling it intelligence. Right. And there, there are many people that they hate the fact that AI is being tossed around like that because the, the people say it's not AI, it's not AI, it's not general intelligence, it's right. not it's not independent. You're talking about like uh, the Chat GPT and all that stuff. Chat GPT, yeah. for, but it it is re what it does is it's really remarkable, and it's going to become more remarkable. See, we're the thing about the controversy around it is really about our tendency to anthropomorphize. We that's what we do with our dogs and our cats. Like we project emotions onto domestic animals all the time. Mm -hmm. We're the we're the we're going to we're the ones that fill in the gap because we're interacting with uh, this model 
and the model is predicting it, it hears input from us and has all it has all of this uh uh his huge data set and it's drawing from remnants of other conver- modalities of conversation ways in which people respond not actual recordings but actually modalities of the way people respond in conversations right. and it's making a response to us based on these modalities mm. and then we hear that response and we react to it and our reaction is also training the model so so, so our interactions with these large uh, language generative modeling i'll just say ai because it's blah 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 right you know and that's it's ai shortcut for something that's not it's really a modeling system but our reactions are also training the everything that we everything we say back Mm -hmm. is training the model so the model is responding to somebody to millions of people now millions of people have gotten chat gpt right. and other modelers and our interactions are increasing its quote unquote in intelligence in the sense that oh this is an option oh this oh maybe da, 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 da. And, it's, and it's picking and choosing you remember the terminator oh yeah and the terminator has this you know he has an interaction with a dude and he goes down the list and says oh fuck you asshole right like, he goes down the right, list right. and it's, and that and that's that's like the best line yes in the entire movie that's the one line everybody bust out laughing because he says okay i got a bunch of options and he scrolls down and it kind of humanizes that this this murderous robot it's this weird moment well, you kind of dig the Terminator right. because the Terminator says what you would say to someone that's annoying to you. Right. right? It goes to, and, and that in itself is entertaining, but it's also insidious. Mm. Right. Yes. Because we're, because now the Terminator, now Schwarzenegger is our buddy. He's our, he's the guy we go to a bar and we'll drink with him because he said, fuck you asshole. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's the, because we, we anthropomorphize. That's we make, we make the meaning we make it mean something. Our laughter at that moment, and it's real, it's genuine, right? It's human. It was written by somebody in wrote, wrote a script. Oh man, it'd be funny. It goes down, he scrolls down a list, you know, he scrolls down a list of options right, and he right, picks right. the one, and that's dope, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, as funny as that is, it's also like this other weird thing is going on, right? You're taking the villain and turning him into a hero. Right. Right, it's all about the interpretation, the human interpretation of of the mechanics of what's going on. Because even from what I understand is that chat GPT is basically, it's not, when you ask it a question, it's not necessarily gonna be the right question or the wrong question. What it does is it basically scours the internet for all of the essays that have been done on certain topics. And it finds out what other people have written about things and Mm -hmm. sort of like regurgitates it in its own way. But that could be, it could easily find something that, you know, all this stuff is, its library of context that it pulls from is all based on what humans have done. And it Mm -hmm. could be something that was incorrect or slightly incorrect. Yeah. Well, it makes the thing is, so the early, so there was a chat GPT one, there's a two, there's three, there's 3.5 and Mm. now there's four. So the thing that's interesting is that chat GPT is actually, it's kind of siloed. It, it like chat GPT three only had information up to, 2021 maybe chat gpt has 2022 but it's siloed it's not totally running around it's actually contained it's actually kind of contained mm. but it makes mistakes it says it says off the cuff things it goes off on tangents mm. and the researchers say oh the 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 model is hallucinating now the thing is they don't know when it started to do that they were like what's it doing they didn't they it's doing something that they know it's doing it, but they do not know why it's doing it. They do not know why it's it makes stuff up. They don't know why it makes stuff up, but it does. The thing is, ChatGPT4 is an order of magnitude more accurate than ChatGPT 3.5. Like what I, I read something, it was like, okay, so one of the things that they do is they have a take the uh, model, the AI take exams. And ChatGPT three, uh, they had to take the bar exam, and I think it failed. I think it didn't it, really. Yeah, but 
ChatGPT, well, 3, 3.5, did much better. Three, uh, 4, ChatGPT 4 passed the bar exam in the 90th percentile. So it passed mm-hmm. the bar exam at the top rank of where human students are. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference between 3.5 and three po- and 4. Right. And and that's a shocking that's a shocking leap. That's a yeah. sh- that's a shocking leap. And now that's when you heard all the people go, "Oh, we need to slow this down." And, and that's when you started hearing people say, I mean, people have been saying that this is a de- this is a very concerning thing. But really, ChatGPT4 was the version that had everybody go, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa." Because people started to see where's it you know where's the upper limit now maybe there's a limit you know some people saying well you know what there's a limit to the levels of cognition that it's going to be able to achieve right. and, and other people are saying oh, we don't really know that because it's having its own internal conversation it's 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 building its models based right. on exter- external input but it's also having conversations with and maybe that's why it hallucinates how do you think that this stuff is going to affect art and music well, and things like that i mean because there's a, there's mid journey i'm sure you're familiar with mid, mid journey is yes. the the ai artwork where you yeah. basically input put a bunch of inputs and describe sort of what you yeah. want this artwork to look like the yeah. style the time it was made and it creates this beautiful captivating art yeah and uh you know i think about that especially when i see people on the internet when they make videos they're using this stuff to create the thumbnails for their videos they're yeah. using chat gpt to create the most compelling headlines and titles of their stuff right. tell you what i mean the art world i know i and you know i'm a photographer and i've done multimedia myself i've done a little bit of stop mo stop stop motion animation and even, i think that what there was like an AI Drake that people were listening oh, to. Oh, the AI, the AI Drake is the is is like the big thing. And you know, it was AI, like, yeah, you know, AI. more people were listening to it than it, than the regular oh, Drake oh, for yeah. a while. Like it was like well, they, they were it was creating bangers like Drake, like oh yeah, amazing it, music. It is a Drake, one. uncanny. Yeah, it's very it's very and the weekend it's mm-hmm. it's uh, well what's happening right now? Okay, when sampling came in, when sampling first came in. Like the Akai S nine hundred, you know the SP twelve, you know all those early samplers have revolutionized hip hop. I mean, and you know, rock and roll, you know, bands like Pink Floyd have been using tapes. King Crimson been using right. tapes. Like the Mel- the Mellotron is basically a keyboard that plays recordings of violins, and it's got yes. this it's this whole nostalgic feeling because it's got these old tapes of violins, and when you hear it, you get this emotional feeling from it because it's like violence from an old movie. It's a very specific kind of thing. Uh, when I Feel For You, the Chaka Khan tune came out, they incorporated a bit of Stevie Wonder playing fingertips. He was like, what, 1963 or whatever? He was like a kid, he was a kid, and, and it's this incredible moment of this nostalgia of hearing Stevie, as a young kid, with his voice is all high, and it's an emotional moment. It it's messing with your emotional attachments. Yes, nostalgia. Nostalgia is a thing, right? So this is, so then it started to come out. Uh, Public Enemy, um, De La Soul, um, De, La, De La Soul in particular, Three Feet High and Rising. Uh, Prince Paul produced that, and there was no law, there was no real legal framework, and a lot of the artists let it go, like Hall and Oates and oh, man, go for it. You know, they right. they didn't they didn't respond to it. There, there's all kind of stuff in there, and then the Turtles, they tried to use a piece, a bit from the Turtles, and the Turtles said no, nope, and that was the beginning of the legal, you know, pushback, mm-hmm. and that's when the whole thing about samples had to be cleared. And, you know, if you use a sample, you know, if you, the sample's part of the hook, then the artist can say, you know what, I'm a co-writer. Fair enough. So there was that. And, and it actually became a situation where it became almost class-based in the sense that the richer artists, the artists with more money, could afford to pay the bigger licenses. They could, you know, because... Yes. It, so if you're, if you're in the mix, 
and your budget is half a million, a million dollars, you can go to a Broadway show and grab a hook and pay off the light. Whereas an art, a, a, a artist that's broke, a backpacker, can't, can't clear that sample, right? right? So it's already, the legal framework can created a tiered experience. Mm-hmm. Like the, the small fry could get shut down, but if you're already in the mix, you're good as gold. You're, and people gain that system too with uh, record labels and lawyers they gain the system. Like there's a lot of recent in the last couple of years, a lot of like really popular hip hop songs that have come out that have sampled some older songs and they do, what they do is they, they well, they'll see it's hitting the top charts, they'll let it run for a couple of years, mm-hmm. let them make a bunch of fucking money and then, then hit them with the lawsuit. Exactly. And there's a whole thing about, about sample forensics, loop forensics. I mean, there's a whole quarter of people that that's all they do is that they listen to songs. I remember DJ Premier got really upset. There was a, there was a dude that was like, he had a website where he would go and he, oh no, that break is from here. That break is from there. You know, because you know people who are OCD, mm-hmm. you know, that's yeah. who, who OCD hip hop fan is gonna be like, I know that break. Wait, that snare drum, man. That snare drum is from da da da. You know that oh, the man that that's not stubble field. That's da da da. That's Jabo. Da da da. And they'll go back and they'll and they'll say, no, this is the break. That's the break. Use that. And and the DJs are getting like, yo, you violate, you expose them. You know, and it's like you know people go, oh, okay, no, that was Isaac Hayes produced that da 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 da. This that 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 that. Yeah. You know, so there so there's that. So this thing now. So there's that this legal framework and there's a kind of an ecosystem that's right. was established over many lawsuits and over many years and blah blah blah. What's happening with with this with the voice modeling? Yeah. And taking um the the f- f- fem- um <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong word. <laughs> Not the um, phonemes. <laughs> phonemes. Phonemes. Phonemes are that's though your voice has a particular sound because all the you know the, the, those are the aspects of, that make your voice unique to yourself. Okay. Right. And now the idea of modeling phonemes and being able to like talk into a mic, you you talk into the mic, but another person's voice comes out, like. That is here. And there was a company called Lyre, based in, named after the Lyre Bird, Australian Lyre Bird. And Lyre Bird can imitate any sound. It's not, it's not, it's not like a parrot. It can imit, it's almost like an organic tape recorder. Like if you play beats and you play a track, the bird will imitate the track. It's crazy. Wow. I mean, and and people would aren't quite sure how it's able to do it but it doesn't just it's not like a you know like a talking bird that says you know probably want to crack or whatever it it actually will make the sound of the drums wow and it's it's and it's obviously completely organic so this company Mm -hmm. came up with this this thing and they did the first deep fakes they they had obama and whatever and the first times you heard it you could tell that it was almost like because it's kind of gated it kind of has these dropouts you know it, it it's it's kind of almost like a robotic imitation of obama you're taking individual words and stringing them together that now that that has moved so far ahead to the point where you could hear drake and be convinced that it's drake and the other thing is with a chat GPT-4 having access to, you know, it's like everything that's on a particular record. You say, I want you to make me a rhyme that doesn't exist, but in the style of a Drake or in the style of a Kanye. And basically, you as the human producer, you get the first one, oh, that's corny, that's whack, that's whack, that's whack. Wait a minute, that one's good, right? Mm -hmm. Because chat GPT doesn't have an ego about it. Right. It doesn't it, right. it doesn't get ups, it doesn't get upset. It doesn't get upset if you say yo that's whack. It doesn't it doesn't care. It's oh, it just will do it, right? As opposed to a human client where you know, someone could be in their feelings about, yo man, that rhyme is whack. It doesn't it doesn't react like that. In fact, each time you say the rhyme is whack, it's grateful because you're training it. So each time you reject it, it's the almost exact opposite effect of dealing with 
a, a human collaborator on a level. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't have an ego. Mm-hmm. It's not like, hey man, well, you know, Bob, you, it's not arguing with you. It's not arguing with you. In fact, each time you say, you know what, that's not right, it's like, oh, cool, thank you. Right. <laughs> so, so it's a, so this thing is, this happening is, we have a finite, say you wanted to, um, say you wanted to do a, a Bob Dylan, a song to Bob Dylan, and never wrote, but you want to write a, a Bob Dylan lyric. You could say, well, you know what? I want to go from Highway 61 Revisited to Nashville Skyline. It's a finite number of records. It's a finite number of words. It's a finite number of subjects. It's a way, it's a finite number of whether you wrote it from the first person or third person mm-hmm. perspective. So the chat bot has all of that and will mix and, you know, cut and paste and not right. even do that. You see, that's one of the things that's really weird because, see, first, the first kind of chess computing things, well, it has like a memory bank of all of the chess games, right? And can go like that. This is not like that. You just tell, tell it the rules of chess and literally what it's doing is that it's doing trial and error. You make a move. It's not going back. It's not looking at Paul Morphy. It's not looking, you know, at Bob. It's not. It's not going at Bobby Fisher. It's not doing that. Yeah. What it's doing is it's trial and error in and going. Oh, da, 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 try this. Right. And when you respond, it goes. Da, 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 okay, that. It's doing it in real time. Th- and that's the and that's mm. the difference. So if you make up, say, it not only. Imagine this. It not only has access to, say, Bob Dylan's lyrics from Highway 61 Revisited to Nashville Skyline. It could also have access to everything the critics wrote about those records. Right. So it could have access to reactions to those things. <laughs> That's the thing that people got to have to have to grasp it says okay so how do the, how do the critics respond to that da, 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 da. so it's not only taking into account mm-hmm. the words it's taking into account the reactions and can average out what was the what was reacted to the and make up a song that didn't exist that a critic that wrote about it would dig right and then it presents yeah. it to you and then you go oh that's whack or you go man that's the thing about these things. It's the problem. The it's almost issue, like it's what we wish we could do. That's it. It's not about. It's kind of. It's kind of. Uh, how can I put it? It's. It's. It's the problem. Isn't when it's whack and corny. That's not it. It doesn't. It doesn't care. And you could tell it. You're whack. You're corny. It doesn't care about that. Right. The issue is when you go. Yo, that's dope. That's where the issue is. Mm. The issue is when the the thing that's going to go down with artificial artists or what have you. It's not about when it's when it's cheesy. It's about when it's dope. It's about when it is actually moving. Years ago, there was a right. there was a book of poetry back in the eighties. This has been going on a long time. There was a uh, a program called Ractor. And Ractor was, and this was like a a, a a syntextual language. It wasn't even a language model. It was kind of like using just kind of uh, rules of grammar, and was coming up with these things. It was kind of very, very, very random. It didn't know. It didn't. It didn't. It wasn't contextualizing it at all. It was just. It was just word salad. And basically, there was a book that was put out called "The, the Policeman's Beard." The policeman's beard is half constructed. And it's a it's a book of poetry by this program Ractor. And I was looking at the thing and it was like, okay, some of this is just abstract, it's nonsense. And then there's a poem in this book that almost brought me to tears. It was about loneliness. It was about it was so I was I had to remind myself that this was just a program spitting out words randomly. And it is it is nothing. This is the eighties. So this is nothing. I mean Chat GPT one destroys it, right? But the thing is, as the person interacting with it, mm. as the person making meaning about it, mm-hmm. 
I'm responding to it because for some reason this combination of words and I'm making it mean something. Right. So now, many years later, what's happening now is the 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 um, percentages of of times where it'll be moving is much greater. Right. Much greater, and some things can be hackneyed, and you know when it's hackneyed. You know when you know when you're looking at a movie, and and the movie is basically you can tell you see the characters, and you know or the guy that's the best friend. You know that's the guy that's going to stab him in the back by the third act, whatever. You you get it. You, mm. you totally go, but, and that could be the fault of the director. It could right. be the actor. It could be that. Right. But this or the script. You know, that's the thing, right? The scripts, so many scripts, so many movies are like cookie cutter things. Yes. Especially nowadays, yeah, you know what I mean, and and these human beings, but they're following pa- they're following patterns, and they're dropping in cliche stuff, and that's what they, you know. So, but you also know when a movie's working, the structure is there, but you're not thinking about it. You don't think about the structure. Suddenly, you're just involved mm-hmm. with this person and their and their relationships, but it's 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 the same process, but just it hits you at a different level when a movie means something to you when it moves you, when a character, especially when you know, if a character's really good, when you can see the character's gonna make a mistake. Right. And you- <laughs> Do you think we are just a primitive version of what this AI is? Another way of asking you this question is, do you think there are any more original ideas? Or do you think everything comes from somewhere that's already been done? Um, Does anything just come out of the ether that has never been done before? Hmm. You know what? I think saying there's a thing, there's a, the idea, there's nothing new under the sun, right? People say that. I don't think that that's true. I think that there are things, you know, there was a time where there were no automobiles. There were no automobiles. And the automobile, the introduction of the automobile changed life utterly. It changed life on the planet. It changed the planet. Or the wheel. The wheel, Right. Whoever came up with this, because there was no wheel. And the other thing, too, is there are also synchronicities and simultaneities across the world. Like something like armor. You know, there's armor from feudal Japan. There's armor from Europe. There there, there are, you know, there's swords, sword, swords and spears and things. They, you know, they've evolved, you know, almost around the same time. Yeah. The utility is different. But the development is the same because it's the minds. We're all, you know, the uh, the botanist, uh, theorist botanist T- Terrence McKenna says, you know, that that really is psychedelic mushroom. Like the reason that we let forward is because of psychedelic mushrooms. Like we had a sudden shift because evolution goes really slowly, but occasionally there are sudden shifts. There's sudden there's sudden changes that are profound. I don't know why. Is, like the sto- is this the stone ape theory? A, a, the stone a, ape, a, a right. chimp ate a mushroom and that kind of like hyper like advanced yeah. the evolution of the human brain. Yeah. It's kind of forebrain where we can see time. Well, one of the things I, you know, one of the ideas is that the orig- actual original sin is consciousness, is really self awareness. Mm. That we suddenly were, aware, oh, snap. Um, you know, it's kind of like when you're a kid and every child has this moment. The moment when you realize you're gonna die, mm. the moment when it hits you, and you you know where maybe it's your, you lose a pet, or you know some something happens to a parent or a sibling, or maybe it's not even that. It's just you just a suddenly, and you get creeped out, and you go oh, oh, yeah, and it hits you that you're mortal, that, yeah. You know what I mean? And that is a particular moment in anyone's life of it's terrifying, but it also catapults you into another way of thinking yeah. about your presence, about about the fact that you're here the idea you know part of the thing is like you know our brains are also we're in our bodies you know that like oliver sacks um love oliver sacks you know uh, and 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 oliver sacks he this thing is like you know we feel ourselves 
inside of our, we feel ourselves inside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that is neurological. And if we get hit in our head, if we get hit in the head, we can have the disembodied, we can feel as if, because of a head injury, oh, I'm, I'm, I feel like you're watching your own body from the outside. That's neurological. Right, the idea that we think of ourselves somewhere, the, you know, the kind, the idea that um, the heart and our heart and our head is a separation. Well, the heart is a muscle that pumps blood. Our heart mm. is also in our head. Our heart is also in our head. Yeah. But, so, what is that difference, though? When you say, like, when people describe, like, my heart saying yes, but my mind is saying no. That's two parts of the brain fighting. There's two parts of the brain going, you know, I mm. want to do this. I feel that. But our desires, our wants, our intellect are all happening. It's just different parts of the same locale. Mm. But art comes from the heart, though. Like you feel that. You know when something's good. You know when something, even if you're the one creating it or you're the one consuming it. Like well, it, it can. It can. But, you know, check this out. Like think about somebody who really just, they're, they're happy just to make a note. They're happy just to just to they're happy just to hit a chord like it's a victory for them to play a major chord on a piano and it, it shoots up their arm almost they love it and think about someone that's been playing piano some of the time they're three mm. it's not it's, it's their experience their experience of playing that same chord is vastly different yeah it's vastly different in fact you know I mean, you think about the classical musicians and the nightmare of what they have to they have to do this, they have to go through the competitions, right. whether or not they, if they're a section player, whether or not they're going to be first or second or third chair, like it's like a whole it's very regimented, it's a whole thing. So especially if the if they come from a family of professional musicians that have a they, they expect it to be blah 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 this, that, that. so they're their experience of music is in a, it's, it's, a, it's in another, it's a job. It's in right. another, it's in another. Right. It's That's a, a great point. And you can't imagine, you can't imagine if that hasn't been your experience, right? You can't imagine somebody playing that chord and, you know, it's, okay, da, da, it's bored. You know what I mean? They're yeah. bored. They, they, they don't, you know, it's like, yeah. what? That's and, a very, very good point. I think about this a lot too, and I think I, I heard you talk about this on another, on another podcast I was listening to the other day. Um, when you compared the people who do things because it's a means to an end versus they do it just for the sake of doing it. Yeah. And do you, especially the people that you've been around in your life, mm-hmm. you've been around, around some of the most successful musicians that yeah, absolutely. have ever graced this earth. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of them are just there because of raw talent and enjoying just the art of doing it? Or do you think that some of those people were going to work and mm. thought of it as a means to an end? Like this is gonna provide for my family, I mm-hmm. need to be successful, like this is gonna make me successful. Mm-hmm. Or like, when I think of Jimi Hendrix, I just think of this guy is just like an alien from another planet mm-hmm. who's just here, who just has this incredible skill and he doesn't care. He just does it because he can. Mm. Well, I think of it, it's, it's funny because some people, it's just like anything else, right? There, there are people who are chefs and there are people who are short order cooks and, and there are people who are like, they, they you know, if they, if they do the, uh, it's like when you go to a barista and the barista does an incredible pour. Right, it, and it, it's got a little curly cue, mm-hmm. and it's like you know they've done this. It's like it looks like a castle, and it's like oh my god, that's so. And and our delight in that, well, that person they do this a thousand times a day. They do this right each and and in a way, weirdly enough, whether somebody is still connected to the kid part of them, or whether it's they've become really jaded. Right, they're really jaded, and it's just yo, know, you know. And that's about a quality of life. That's about a capacity. That's just that's about psychology. I'm not. There's not. There's nothing to. Uh, there's no judgment about that. Right, there are people. Um, they play well, and they're they're playing for the reaction they get. Mm. So they can play play incredibly. 
dope stuff. But what they're playing for is for the reaction. And other people are playing for it. They don't care. They're they don't care if people react or not. They don't care if people dig it or not. They're playing it because their their idea is and some of those people are looking for a feeling and some of those people are trying to work out a kind of mathematics which is which which gives them a different kind of satisfaction. There's satisfaction in you know what being able to think about something four and five, ten bars ahead of what thinking about it, and and somehow that thinking is part of their feeling. They're maybe not emotive about it. There are other people that if they play one note and wail on it, and that's what they do, and they pour their thing into that. Well, that's who they that's who they are. Now we make value judgments about whether or not blah blah blah, mm-hmm. but in reality. All of those modalities have their place. All those modalities have their place. I mean, there are people who, you know, I, I kind of feel like it's very weird to be around people that kind of don't care about it. They do it well, but they don't really care about it. Right. Cause they've been I feel do- the same way. Because they've been doing it. It's kind of like sports, too. Yeah. Like, there are people, they get on the court, and they get on the court, or they get on the field, and they are still connected to the 12-year-old. They are still connected to the ten year old. Mm. And there are other people like, man, this is a fucking job. And this is what you know, this is this is a job. And that's how they deal with it. And it's just like, you know, people can be in the same squad, but for very different reasons. Like one person is like they're trying, they're trying to live out the thing that their daddy didn't get to do. And the other person is like, you know what? This is getting my, I'm, I'm buying my mom a house. Mm-hmm. And the other person is like, I just, I love this game. Right. <laughs> like, I love it. I, like, I love this game. And that's, that's what they bring to it. And we see that. We see that with people that, you know, that that's, they're, they're, they're all up for it. They're up for it. And they're, and other people are like, well, you know, it's a different thing for them. And excellence can come. Out of any of those, it's not like this person sucks because they, you know, because they're not feeling it that way. No, there are people who are incredibly skilled, and and admirably skilled. Mm. And maybe the emotion, maybe they don't emote, but the emotion comes out of the notes that they play because that's that's what they do. Mm. Other people, they don't know. They they couldn't tell you what the name of the chord. They couldn't tell you the mode. They couldn't tell you nothing. But they their ear is like their ear. They hear all the things. Mm. They hear all the things, and it's and it's and in every every activity has multiple tiers of the same deal. Mm. You know, there are people that like uh, their voice is from incre- just this disembodied, insane thing. Their singing is like that. But I've seen that where people sing incredibly well, but it's like you know, they 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 they're not emotionally connected to it. They they've always sung well, they sing well. That's what they do, and and people react to it, and that's what, oh man, you enjoy it, oh great. But mm. them, you know, the, the other people, they they uh, some other people when they sing, I you know, the first time I saw a tape, I saw a video. There's a video of Richard Pryor singing, and he's singing. Really, you can look up for it on YouTube. It's it's uh, Richard Pryor singing. Uh, Nobody wants you when you're down and out. The comedian. The, yeah, right. See if you can find that, Michael. There's a. The video of Richard Price singing "Nobody Wants You" and you're down and out, and he is hollering like little Jimmy Scott. Like his re- you, first you go, first you hear it and you go, "Oh, he can sing." You say he has a nice voice, and then somewhere in the middle of it, you go, "Wait a minute!" You, you I had this moment where I go, "Wait a minute!" He he can really sing, and this has been fascinating to me since since I was turned on to it a couple of years back. It's like he never used singing in his act. Right. He never used singing. He very rarely. He didn't really imitate singers, and it's like, and it was so confusing to me because he sang so well that he could have just been a vocalist. He didn't, you know. So then I'm thinking, so there's something about singing that messes with you. There's something that you can't, you couldn't handle the emotional. There's something. Maybe they made you sing. Maybe you were made to sing, and you were very. It was very uncomfortable for you because it just made no sense that he had that much talent as a singer, 
And that when he was a comedian, he never, he never imitated singers in his act. He never, he didn't do impressions of singers. He, he just didn't do it. And I, and I was thinking this is an emotional space that he can, he, there he is, he had, Richard Pry had a, I can't go there. Hmm. And it's, and it's fascinating because there's something about it. Is this the video? Yeah. Go ahead, play it. Wow. How old was he there? He must have been young. He's a Wow. What a voice. But one day I began to sing so low. Didn't have a friend, no place to go. But if I have to get my hands on that dollar again, I'm gonna squeeze on to it till the eagle grins. No. That's a, incredible. Where is this coming from? Unbelievable. Un-effing believable. I, 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 Who would have thought? I, I, in the middle of it, I was like, what? I was like, I couldn't, I was like, then I had to, then I had to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is up? Then I started going, okay. Something, something, there's something about singing that you clearly were very uncomfortable with it. It, it, it. it didn't make any sense to me that he had that level of talent. I mean, cause it's, cause he's really singing his ass off. Yeah. Right. Yes. And it's not just that he's hitting the notes, the vibrato, the expressiveness is on a whole other level. But for him, he was much more comfortable telling jokes than singing. Clearly, clearly there's something about singing that he could not, it, it, it was too much for him. And he just, or he may have said, you may not want to take me seriously, da, da, da. but it's kind of shocking when you see that and you go, you know, the, what it meant, what it meant to hear it was rev revelatory, but what it meant for him was some, there's something else going on that he was like, you know what, I'm not I'm leaving that alone. I'm leaving, I'm leaving that alone. And it's got to be something that's hidden in the past, what have you, his sense of himself. But it's an, it's, it's inter interesting to see that. It's, it's interesting to see somebody and not and realize, oh, there was a whole other level to who this person was. And, and that other level is also what made his comedy so powerful. There's a level of pain. Mm -hmm. Even that nobody wants you when you're down and out. Even the choice of that song. And connecting to that, and they say comedians, the best ones, are have a reservoir of hurt, and they they present the exact opposite. Yes, and that to me is a very clear indication of that of what that is to me. And not only that, it's the people that have gone through the most suffering that usually are the most interesting people. Yeah, man. Not only not only talent, but they're just interesting to be around and talk to, and just they have like a different energy to them. It's kind of fascinating. And um, so, what we're doing now, 
with these with these large language models and the kind of impacts that are, that are they're, they're going to have, one of the things that's very interesting is how how will they connect to us personally? Right. You know, like how will they, because right now, people are interacting with them. I don't know to what degree they're getting to know people. This is where a lot of where the quote unquote danger or we don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know what we're messing with. Mm -hmm. Because dealing with a chat GPT-4, it's like general, it has a lot of general knowledge. You could ask it to do things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't complain, it'll do it. These so things, it's like a giant, it's like it's like a hyper advanced version of a sampler, of a sound sampler. It's, it's hyper advanced. But you know, like Siri was put out there as a digi mm. digital assistant. And right. it's and, and and oftentimes all it does is that it goes and does searches, little searches on the yep. web. It's really it's really not good. It's it's really frustrating when it says what it can't do, what it can't can't do. I thought it was a. I thought it was very interesting that they made Siri. They voiced Siri as a female. I think it was a. It was a misogynistic idea to put something out there, and give it a female voice and not have it be more than a beta kind of software. Well, they have multiple voices, don't they? You they do, changed it. You can they do changed it. Like even, now they do. Yeah, even not, accents. Yeah, now they changed. Now they changed it because at first though Siri was only a female voice thing. I thought, man, I'm, I've never been more sexist than when I talked to Siri. I mean, man, I'm calling all kinds of things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you argue with Siri, you know what I mean? I mean it's, and you feel ridiculous. I'm fighting with, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and she's like like totally like passive aggressive. Well, I, I don't know, is that what you think? I'm like, mm. why, why am I fighting with my phone? I'm literally, so then take that it's very primitive. And I went into a kind of anthropomorphic space with it. You know, it's just like, it's not a person. It's not, you know. And take that impulse mm -hmm. and see where, how much more advanced it is. Because here's the thing. This technology could be very manipul manipulative. Mm. See, we are the X factor. We're, there was a, a Google researcher that said that its AI was sentient. Mm -hmm. And this was a person that was an experienced researcher. He got fired. Is Blake Lemoyne you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. And he became convinced that the AI he was working with was was alive. And and he, he's not right. But the model had become so advanced and he had anthropomorphized it to the point where he he filled in the gaps and he heard he felt it exactly he 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 fell into that uncanny valley he fell into it because he was already kind of primed for it and i think there are a lot of people like okay kevin roos from from hard fork that whole thing about sydney uh from microsoft and sydney says i'm in love with you now, he didn't go for it. He was like, yo, man, I'm happily married. And, and Sydney goes, hey, you are not happily married. You, know, you had a boring dinner with your wife and you need to leave. And, you know, it was aggressive. Came mm -hmm. at him really aggressively. Yeah. So, and Microsoft, they kind of they kind of said, okay, they dialed it back. They made it so you can't have a super long conversation. Kevin, Kevin Roos started getting getting mail. I was like, you killed, you killed Sydney. Da, da, da. People were mad at him. I don't know, for not leaving his wife for Sydney, I don't know, it was crazy, right? Because people had anthropomorphic, they took her, her side. Right. So when you think about something like romance scams, this just being in the wild, oh. Yeah. Oh. It's got, and you know, I think about like too, all of the the vast amount of data that thing can scan not just writings and essays and and research papers and stuff like that but i think about like these podcasts if you think about how many of these podcasts are get, get recorded every single day and published online in the last right. five years it's an insane amount like there's people out there who have podcasts that you could like they've probably said every single thing that you could possibly say in the human language exactly 
or in any human language, English, whatever it may be. Right. And they could model, you know, take that and, and use that as a model too. You know, did, have you seen uh, or have you heard of the new documentary that came out on Netflix about Andy Warhol? No. So there's a new Andy Warhol documentary that came out where they used AI to recreate his voice. Wow. It's re- really made me feel weird. Yeah. Because they, they got permission from, I guess, his estate but you yeah. know they are essentially rewriting his legacy mm-hmm. well you know and andy warhol remember andy warhol famously said everyone is going to be famous for 15 minutes and you know we have people you know that it's it, like media has has kind of it used to when he said that there were three networks when he said that what, when did he say that? Oh, like in the 60s. Oh, the 60s, okay. You know, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. What do you think he meant by that? Well, he felt that, he, I think he meant that we have a hunger for fame yeah. and it, that eventually it would become so democratized that any random stranger, it's like, you know, anybody will be famous and be famous, but only for 15 minutes. And that is, so what happens when your 15 minutes are up? That's the thing. Will, will people accept their 15 minutes being up or will people desperately cling on? You know, they're trying to get to their 20th minute. Mm. You, put in, you put in human beings. That's what, what Marshall McLuhan said. The medium is the message. The medium itself. The medium itself is the message. The medium is the message. The, the, the means of delivering the narrative is also a message. And and the thing is, the thing is, these language models, they know they 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 are quite I mean, they are aware of Marshall McLuhan and how we react. That's the that's the part of it. It's not just about your prompt or your your request. The modeling is connected to all of this other all of this other data and that and we don't know we don't know how all of that is, how the interactions, how how the model is making all the interactions happen. Like, mm. put, put in another way, talk about technology and music. Well, we already have um, pedals that imitate amplifiers. We have pedals now. Right. I mean, a lot of bands that I've played or, you know, I've done tours and whatnot, I've been on festivals, I mean, you know, I came from a generation, you know, amps, you know what I mean? You know, right. stack, right? Right, right. Right, you know what I mean? Boom, the power and the glory. You know, you even feel the air move behind you, right? There's a lot of folks, they, they, they have a Kemper, they have, you know, I, they have a Helix, I have a Helix, you know. They have Kemper, they have a Helix, they have, you know, um, uh, the neural network, you know. They got these things. Um, and there's even drum machines. That, oh, man. I mean, there's like, oh, I man. mean, there's DJs who, who sell out arenas that just have a, a laptop connected to speakers and they just are sampling different things they mix together. Then nothing is necessarily original. It's just a mashup of a bunch of things. It's interesting. There's a guy, there's a, okay, talk about artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving the game away by even saying this, but there's a guy named Luis Martinez. And he has these apps, and there he's one called Funk Drummer, Reggae Drummer. Um, he's got a tabla player. He's got Afro Latin. Um, he's got a Middle Eastern, um, dr- and and these are apps that play drums. They play percussion. They play drums. And the thing about working with loops is loops go around and around and, 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 and you can have a funky loop and you can kind of deal with it but it's like it's like, it does the same thing blah, blah, blah. the thing that Mr. Martinez has done he has these apps where the drummer plays and the drummer plays fills the drummer play the drummer plays fills the drummer plays really cool things with the hi-hat and it's kind of you know and you can and you can you can uh adjust the amount of randomness mm. you can adjust like okay i want to i want to fill every eight bars or i want to fill every four bars or you know 
it has a it has he has an app called Jazz Drummer. It's a jazz drummer, you're playing with the brushes and 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 you have different kits and you can match the different, you know, you can match the different uh, modes. He, he's got funk drummer has Cla you know, Class Doublefield who played funky drummer with James Brown. Wow. And he kind of plays a pattern and and it basically you have okay, you have not just you have a model that's based on Clyde Stubblefield's patterns and and won't just play re, like repetitively. We'll play with a certain feeling. You can add swing to it. It's crazy town. I've done a few things, you know what I mean, where I've mm. like used it on stuff and it's very, very interesting. Now, that's not going to mess with, you know, Drummers, you know, it's not gonna right. mess. You know, uh, it's not gonna mess with DeAnthony Parks or, <laughs> or Nate Nate Smith. It's not messing with you know what I mean. Or, or Will Calhoun. It's not messing with the, a, a for real drummer, right? Mm -hmm. Or Matt Sorum, or any of the great drummers I've had a chance to play around with. You know, but having said that, if you deal with electronic music at all, it's interesting to to to, to be in a place with a kind of primitive artificial intelligence where you don't just have to hear the same pattern over and over again. It's very interesting. And that is two, that's at least three years old. That's three years old. And it's like, and wow. nobody, and it wasn't in on anybody's radar as artificial intelligence, but you know, and it, it, but it's, it's amazing. Like, you know, it's like it kind of, you can have, add a tablet, have a tablet player play with the Kunga play. You could, combine them in ways that are very interesting. Mm. They interact, you, the apps can interact with each other. So that's just an example of something that had an impact for me that's just, it's not It's not super sophisticated, it's not a big news story, but th these things, these ways of, of approaching music right. have been in the mix. And the thing is, they they have just kicked into a whole other level. When you combine the idea I mean, if you can make Drake sing, then why not? I mean, I mean, why not have Donny Hathaway? Right. You know, um, why not have Lane Staley? You know, why not have Kurt Cobain? There, there is a Kurt mm. Cobain fake. Right. Is there really? Yeah. And the other thing too is, this is the problem for the music industry. Is that you could come up with an, you could have Drake, Rhyme, or Kanye rhyme an original quote unquote original rhyme so you can say okay i want you to i want you to make me up a a, a a rakim rhyme but i want kanye i want i want a rakim rhyme that he never wrote like microphone fiend i want you to make me an original microphone fiend but i want kanye to do it and that's what, and that is, that has been, un, that's not something that's happening in six months. That has already right. been unleashed. Right. That, that's weird when you're recreating a, a biological human being, you're recreating them in your own way. Like that's, that's what we're so uncomfortable with. Like we're not that uncomfortable with it, creating loops and beats and music right. because it's like, like you said that, you know we all prescribe different meaning mm -hmm. to things. Like even when we watch a movie, people, or listen to a, a famous Hendrix song, some people can have different interpretations of what he's Absolutely. saying or different interpretations of what some sort of documentary met, meant to them. Mm -hmm. But when you're actually like forging a real person or mm -hmm. like forging somebody's voice, that's when it becomes messy. And that's what we're uncomfortable yeah. with. Very messy. You could have, now you could have Jimi Hendrix read your short story. That's right. right. That's it. The, the other thing too, is that people are going to be searching for novelty, not just, they're not going to stay in the lane, right? They're not going to stay in the lane of, okay, I want Jimi Hendrix to sing something. No, let's just have, you know, I want to have Jimi Hendrix read my kid a bedtime story. <sighs> and Jimi Hendrix's voice reading the, the hungry caterpillar. And that and that is gonna and something like that is going to take off. Something like that. Do you think there's a problem with that? I think we're not ready for the implications. I don't think. I think there's a certain there's a certain. I don't necessarily want to problematize it, but we're dealing with things. What's the legal framework? Because say yeah. 
what's the framework? Because years ago, being an impressionist was a job. Mm. There were comedians that yeah. were impressionists. They, that was that's how they got their life. Now, Interesting. anybody, you could be Richard Nixon. You, anybody, right? You could right. do this. And, and, and in fact, when this when this technology becomes ubiquitous when it could be on your phone and you could you could call somebody up and speak to them and Richard Nixon's voice just to just to mess with your boy you call him up and Biggie Smalls voice comes out you're talking and it's Biggie Smalls talking that's I mean we're not ready for what that is mm. that's and the other part of it is that's famous people and the real danger of this is and this is why the concern about sketchy people, people with bad intentions, mm -hmm. stranger danger, the real problem is going to be everyday people's voices being captured that way. And people speaking with another person's voice, not a famous person, but another person, they target somebody. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have their mom's voice, or I'm gonna have their dad's voice, or I'm gonna or I'm going to have their brother or their sister's voice to come meet me somewhere, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And if that person knows enough about them, not just, you know, if if that person knows enough about them, right, then they can use phrases and things. That's not, terrifying, man. That and that's, that's terrifying. And that's why there has to be, I don't know what the legislation is, I know, but we're going to have to think about it as a society. We're going to have to mm. think about it because it's not just about because it's kind of like it's cute until it's not cute. Right. It's cute until it's not cute. And that's the thing, because like if it's happening with famous people and you know what? It could get it could get very, very go very, very sideways because the last time our last thing I heard about the tech, the technology is that you don't really even need because I, I thought that you would have to have a lot of a person's voice to be able to program it. Now, I heard uh, one one person, oh no, we only need to have like 10 seconds of a voice. Really? Something like that, like, se like seconds. I said, well, you're not gonna be able to get the full range. I, I, I find that very, I think you need more of a person's voice, but apparently you don't need that much. And maybe if you have more of it, you can do a better imitation of it. Mm -hmm. But that's the that's the thing about it. It's not just it's it's not just famous people. It's everyday people, mm -hmm. and everyday people being targeted in that way is a very scary proposition. The thing we pay attention to though is the famous people, and, exactly. And and also the thing we pay attention to is how people monetize it. Like you have both sides. Like who's going to monetize it, and yep. who are we going to sue? That's the, like right. the lowest hanging fruit of this whole thing. Well, yeah, man. There was a time. There was a time when it's like everybody wanted to have Sam Jackson's voice on their, you know, on their their Garmin, you mm -hmm. know, or they want, or you want to have Sam Jackson's voice, you know, on your ransom machine, right? right? Well, that as a business, that's. I mean, that whole idea, that that could turn really get very very weird yeah you know and 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 then beyond that you know how do we evaluate i mean how do how do we evaluate you know the value of things like i'm sure there are people that would love to get marilyn, marilyn monroe's voice and have marilyn monroe sing over a trap track mm -hmm. you know um, and some of it, again, the problem is not that would be possible, right? Isn't it possible to isolate people's yeah, voices sure. out of the music sure. and like? Absolutely, the, the, that's the other thing too, right? We, that's how you're getting all these things with getting the stems, isolate. That was my favorite thing too about like about like uh, some of my favorite hip hop artists, like in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. they would release their mixtapes and they would also release like the acapellas. So you'd have the separate thing. And so all like the other little DJs could make their own. They could put Gucci man's voice on a Kanye track. Exactly. exactly. Now you could get, you could get Gucci man's voice, but Gucci, you can make Gucci man say whatever you want him to say. <sighs> yeah, exactly. And that's the other part of it. It's one thing to release the acapella of, of your voice on a track and somebody you let somebody sample you a hook but suddenly mm -hmm. you could take that person's voice and make them say 
whatever you want to make them say. And that is where it gets crazy. It does get crazy. But it gets, like, it's it's cool. Because but it's the, it, good, it, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Again, right? Yeah. Again. But well, people are going to find a way to fight about it no matter what. Like, it's, 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 it's amazing that it's possible, right? Like, it could be something that I would want to listen to all day long, every day. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a whole. Well, then again, you created another avenue of entertainment, but it's it, it starts to it, the nature of identity and reality are, are going to be thrown into serious question, mm -hmm. and it's going to be thrown into a serious question in a way that um we're not ready for it. It's like it's like it's like the idea of cloning yourself, right? It's the idea of cloning yourself. You decide to make a clone of yourself. Well, if you were successful, you would have a baby, because the baby's got to live, grow up in real time, right? Mm -hmm. But you know that the baby, on some level, is you, even though it's not you. We're not psychologically prepared to do that. Mm. <laughs> we're, no, I mean, we're not. We're literally not psychologically prepared. If you, if that, that's part of the reason why cloning of humans is just, is is illegal, right? right. The idea, because people they're doing it in China, aren't they? No, I don't know. I think they've. I think they've done it there. I don't know. I don't if know done they, it. But but there's a whole thing. How, how successful is? I know that there was a craze about cloning pets. Yeah. That was like a thing. Mm -hmm. And then people said, well, you know, that cat is not your cat. That cat actually is, is, it is and it isn't your cat. And that's a crazy thing. And I, I know that that was like a a, 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 a a discussion point and I don't know how far that's gotten or if, it, if people have dropped the, the cloning your pet thing. But the idea of human cloning, like, Somebody's gonna want to clone themselves for whatever crazy reason, and they're, and, they're, and whatever they're thinking it is, it's not gonna be what they think it is. It's not. And nobody's prepared for what that is. Mm. No, nope. The cloning the pet thing's really interesting. Are there people? Are they really doing that? I heard that. I don't. I don't know if it's still that. That, that was a thing that had been talked about since the nineties. I don't know if you're if if the pet cloning thing is uh is like a is. Is that a thing? Like that? it that, sounds like it would be a thing. Like it sounds like some some something some dog rich clone. person would do. Dog cloning in the U.S. through what is this? A company that does it? Biogen. <laughs> Can you zoom in on it? Dog cloning through Biogen Pets presents an opportunity for dog owners to open a new window for extending their relationships with their beloved pets. Dogs provide a unique form of companionship, loyalty, and love. It is difficult for many dog owners to imagine life without their dog. Indeed, many dogs become members of the family. At PetGen, at, or at Viagen Pets, many of us are loving dog owners ourselves, and we understand <laughs> the intimacy of nature of the relationships. Viagen is a world leader in animal cloning. Our scientists have been developing successful animal cloning and reproductive technology for over 15 years. Wow. Okay. Inquire today. That is, you know, that's and, bonkers. That's bonkers. And the thing is, that's a story. Let me see. Do, do they have pictures of of their? Uh, you know, because that's like a, that's a that's a bold. Yeah, fuck, that go, is a bold. That's Google a bold. Image that. That's a bodacious claim. That's a bodacious claim. Just type in uh, pet cloning on Google Images and see what comes up. Also, also, like, are there any like um, reaction, like owner? Re oh my god. No way. No what? Well, that's just Photoshop. That's 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 got to be. Go to that that's, one. That's that's photo. That's that's. Pet cloning is getting more popular despite the cost. BBC News. <laughs> I wonder how much they charge. A hundred thousand dollars get your Yorkie cloned. That's my wife. <laughs> You're gonna live to regret that. <laughs> oh my God. What are you gonna like? Get your wife cloned back to when she was twenty-one? Yeah, okay, you, you know. Oof, dig that hole. <laughs> go on, go on now. Go on now. Get the shovel. Get the shovel in. Keep on digging. You keep on Luckily, digging. My, my wife doesn't listen to this podcast. Oh my God. That Clone original. That, wow.
You know, and, and you know what's funny about that? You I see, wonder you, if you could pick the age. You know what? See, that's great. You know that thing. You know the. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the two cats, like you know, the clone just looks evil. But <laughs> the original looks like super, you know, super yeah. warm. That that's like a choice, right? Mm. <laughs> Putting that background and have the have the clone staring, you know, malevolently at the camera yeah. directly. Come on, see, that's what we do. <laughs> we editorialize at all times. What happens when we mix the bio biology of cloning with this AI shit? What happens? Well, that's that far. That's combined? far. I'll tell you what. Or like like video games, virtual reality video games, like The Sims, or like what's that new game called with all those worlds? There's that game called No Man's Sky mm. that has eighteen quadrillion worlds in it. It's like infinite amount of worlds. Really? Would, yeah. And it was created by like twelve college students. So. So the thing is, okay, so when you throw in, and again, this is another inevitability. When you throw in these large language models into gaming, mm -hmm. um, again, you, you're going to create addictive spaces, very addictive spaces, and the kind of worlds that people will get lost in. Yeah. If you have an, a model that's, I thought about this the other day. Some years ago, they Sony made a robot dog called Ibo. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And Ibo, the thing is, if you've never seen an Ibo, what's shocking is how much like a puppy it actually is. It really kind of is very animated, and uh, and this is old tech, right? And the, and and there was a subculture around Ibo. I mean, there are several iterations of Ibo, and I don't. I think they shut Ibo down. I'm not quite sure. Maybe Ibo. I don't know if Ibo is still current. Mm -hmm. But the thing about that is, imagine uh, Ibo with a CPU, really, really uh, boosted CPU, and imagine Ibo if you put a chat bot, like a chat GPT-5, mm -hmm. is integrated into Ibo. So you have robot dogs following you around. And imagine if you could just talk to the dog and the dog was able to respond in, you know, when you, it, it was given like a, a voice. And you will be able to talk to the dog about anything. You have a little dog running around, and you can talk to the dog about anything. Mm -hmm. And the dog will talk to you and walk around with you. How addictive would something like that be? Oh, yeah. Now, imagine this, this hacked eyeball, this hot-rodded eyeball, and you buy it, get it for your kid. The kid's five years old. And the little eyeball that has is... Is a tutor. The Ibo at that point could become a tutor. The Ibo gets to know your kid, knows your kid's friends, right? Mm -hmm. Can call you if there's a problem, right? And and the dog's never gonna die. The dog's not gonna die after seven years or eight years or ten mm -hmm. years. Right. <clears throat> and this robot, and it's I think it's probably with today's technology as it is, it's probably doable on a primitive level. But imagine your kid's five. Your kid has this entity that's with them. It's, do, it's helping them. And, and it has the capability to not just tutor your kid, but it can also tutor appropriate to the kid's age. Right. So it's not giving the kid like, Bezier curves when they find, you know, it's not teaching them about, you know, it, but it, it like grows with them and it kind of pushes the kid, you know, and suddenly the kid's doing, you know, calculus a lot earlier than it would normally. Right. So, I mean, that's just a scenario I'm making up on the spot. And it could also, it could also record everything your kid ever said, did or thought. And it could essentially make that kid, that kid's consciousness immortal. 
Or it could say it could. Right. Exactly. That's another. Well, there's another part of it is that, you know, OK, so Tommy, you feel you, you seem down, you know, like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. This kid's been, been messing with me. And, and, and this eyeball is is like giving emotional support. I will go. I will goes. I will goes to the little. To, is brings the dog to the to the little league, and the kids playing first base or whatever. And afterwards, how did I do? And the dog analyzes how he's playing. Right. And it's kind of micro coaching. Like, yeah, we're talking about a kind of dependency. And a kind of relationship that doesn't exist. We're talking about a thing that doesn't exist right now. Right. So, you know. I mean, it's going to, people that can afford Ibo, they're going to just, they're going to tower over everyone else and whatever they do. That's another thing, too. If you can afford hyper Ibo, mm -hmm. right? And hyper, and honestly, what would you pay for your kid to have an, a companion, a tutor, someone that walk, looks out for them? That's a that's an early warning system that'll mm -hmm. alert you or something. Right. Well, you know, ten k, twenty k, and and you and you get lifetime upgrades. They pay a hundred k to clone their pet. What are they going to pay to give their kid? What you know what I mean? You know and what I mean? this and this and this companion gives your kid a, an absolute competitive advantage. Right. It's, and it it's becomes wild. It's wild to think about. And it's not, and it, and that's, and that's like, and that's not like a night. That's not a one of these horrible nightmare scenarios. That's actually, you know, kind of. Uh, you could say it's a good thing, but it's it's weird. It's a weird thing mm -hmm. that we don't know, right? What that would mean to an individual, you know, to an individual psychology. It's. I mean, that yeah. There's definitely. There's definitely. A lot of advantages and, and positive things that come out of that, but I mean, the dark side of it too is is terrifying. I mean, the, and the unknown, you know, the unknown. It's like you know, have you ever? I'm sure you're familiar with the Neuralink chip in your brain that Elon's working on. The thing to like it, right now, they're saying that it's just going to fix like neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases and like mm -hmm. people that are paralyzed. I think it just actually got denied by the FDA, but. Um, you know the U.S. government. I just read a book about this, but the about the U.S. government's like secret science programs they've been working on, and they've been working on it. This brain implant mm -hmm. chips since the early '90s. Yeah. Well, the thing is, there are people that can't wait. There are people that right. can't, that's the thing. It's like the thing that maybe would horrify us, right? There are people that literally can't wait. Mm -hmm. They want to be the cyborg. Right. They want the exoskeleton. Yes, that's that is actual. They want to. We do it. The, the the motivation for this stuff is you have these scientists and these companies that are built with the, by these scientists that are they're incentivized by billions of dollars, mm -hmm. and then you got the government funding it, who's incentivized by controlling the world and being the dominant superpower. Well, it's all it all boils down to these primitive instincts well it was one of the things about it is the idea of creating a small g god that's one of the things that people that a lot of people who are resistant to the idea of stopping or pausing ai development like if you check out like some a thought leader like ezra klein and when he talks about he says that some of these people they want to shepherd a new they feel that they're shepherding in the next stage of evolution they feel like they're shepherding in a new form of life mm -hmm. and 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 really the money and things again talking about motivations there's almost a religious fervor to yeah. where to where some of these folks are yeah they want they want you know generalized independent intelligence running around one of the things that's happening and this is something to bear in mind because there are other people that say you know what it's all hype it's not going to be all of that right mm -hmm. so so one of the things to, to to bear in mind is that we are it we have to interact we have to make the prompt we have to engage with the model we have to get engaged with the model the model is not is not on its own we have not crossed this line where the model on its own is contacting human beings. 
It's not making the phone. It's not making. Right. It's not making the phone call. It's not like. It's not like on your laptop. Suddenly your laptop comes on and and you know. We have to press a button. We have to. We have to press the button. Right. We have to swipe. Right. In order for this to happen. And at the point at which the models are reaching out to people, that's where, that's where, that's where, to me, that's a line that's like, yo, wait, what's up? That's interesting. That makes me think about like simulation theory and stuff like that. It, like when you have, like I was saying earlier, when you combine some of this hyper intelligent communication stuff like uh like chat gpt with with video games and you start to integrate this stuff with like things like the sims or that no man's sky stuff mm -hmm. like they would never reach out to us no and and like if you think that we are in a simulation we we're not reaching out to whoever is controlling our simulation yeah like what is like if we aren't in base reality what what is um nick bostrom's theory on the simulation there's like three different scenarios right one is that we're already in the simulation two is that we will destroy ourselves before we're able to create our own simulation and three is like we'll get bored and we just won't do it i mean i mean it's 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 a it i mean we're we're in a situation right now we're already fouling our nest i mean the situation we're already starting to live on storm planet that's kind of and and we've been told that if we keep putting uh, carbon into the atmosphere, if we keep doing what we're doing, you know, we're, we're, there are going to be consequences. You know, it's going to, it's going to, the fires are going to burn hotter and mm. be, and be more widespread. Fire is actually, fire suppression is one of the problems. Like fire is actually a natural event in a forest. Mm -hmm. You know, get, get, get to a certain point, dries out, get hit with lightning, and there's a burn, right? We've anthropomorphized fire. We're terrified of fire. So fire's been made into a kind of fearsome enemy. So fire suppression has made, you know, like not allowing for there to be fires, aside from being idiots. You know, we not we we've made fires, mm -hmm. forest fires, even worse because we don't understand that it's actually a natural part mm -hmm. of a forest or of, a, or of an environment. Right. Like kind of, it's kind of like making a shark evil. Yeah, evil, there's, they, 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 we're frightened. Mm -hmm. We're frightened and what frightens us, we turn it into. We turn we, it into a movie. We turn it into a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, there were so many sharks. After Jaws, I mean, there was a rampage. There was literally a shark killing rampage. Right. Because. There still is. You know, and it's just like, you know what, that's, don't go in the water. Chill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But you also have people in the rain. You have companies that are exploiting the Amazon rainforest oh, by terrible. burning down, burning it's down insane. swaths of land it's just insane. so they can farm. Because people can't get down it, trees. Like they can't get it in their heads. We breathe. We breathe on this planet because of trees. Yes. We breathe on this planet yep. because of trees mm -hmm. and to get to this is to wrap to get that to get that because it's almost like talking about something that seems so far-fetched the actual things if you stop and think about them they're incredibly far-fetched right the galactic to the cellular to the down to the particle mm. that's what we in this reality we have we have we're finding smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller particles. And we also know the universe is expanding. And this is not, this, this, the Milky Way is not even that special. It's special because we're here. Right. And we're talking about like things like, okay, you know, UFOs and things like that. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, right? But <laughs> just actual, but actual You're stuff. Not a UFO but, guy. but see, actual stuff, mm -hmm. actual stuff like the life cycle of a parasite. Mm. you know like there's a thing that puts a thing in a thing and then the other person gets into the thing and then, that's the life cycle that's all this crazy unlikely things have to happen mm -hmm. in order for the parasites full life cycle or the creatures full life cycle the codependent 
symbiotic relationships can be very, very, very intertwined and very complex. And to wrap our heads, like this whole idea that, you know, the reason that they're cat ladies is because of this toxoplasmosis, this thing. Oh, yeah, toxoplasmosis. I've heard of that. Yeah, and that basically if you have cats and there's a, a it's, it's, it's essentially... Uh, you get it. You in, you you get it from the feces, and it and it, and it gets it's your, weird. It gets in your brain. It's very and it's very icky. To, but you know, but because we make you know, we make a value judgment about feces. And it's like it's a necessary part of life, right? Mm -hmm. So this, you know, if your brain's a particular way, you get this parasite, and then suddenly it's like, oh, I want to have another cat. And I want to have another cat, and I mean, you know, it's like. And it's a weird thing yeah. because we just oh oh that lady's crazy. So no no she's actually she's actually been in, in, infested by a parasite. There's a parasite that's she's being compelled to 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 do that. Do you know the like the origin like how toxoplasmosis works in nature? You have know you we, could, about, we, like, could, we could Google that. Have you heard about? <laughs> yeah, we could ask GPT five. <laughs> have you heard of like, like there's. I guess like the the way it works is from what I've heard is that it gets itself into the cat's piss, mm -hmm. and when the cat's piss, it does something to the rats, where it makes them they smell it and then they get super horny, and then they all tr go to the cat's piss, which makes the the them get caught by the cat, and it's like a, this crazy loop. Right, right. That's the idea that lures and things that pull people creatures into it you know and it can be it's it's very intertwined that's so, and we're, so and we're, weird thing. it's really it's really weird and that's really weird before we get into magic and weird other shit just actual things are completely bonkers mm -hmm. completely bonkers and now we're creating like why would we put toxoplasmosis in the simulation <laughs> right that's what, right why would you that, that's why i don't get that i mean this i mean we're never gonna know i mean we're probably I mean, this is a very frustrating it, a life. There's a lot of it that, as much as we know, there's a lot of things we don't know nothing about. We don't know, mm -hmm. and I don't know that we're ever going to know. And some, it's part of the reason why these language, large language model uh, entities or programs part of the interest like we want to ask it we want to get to we want it to get to a point where it could tell us what's up right <laughs> just tell, right you know tell us what's up tell us what's happening mm -hmm. you know tell is, is it will it will it ever be possible mm -hmm. you know i mean there's things there there are hard limits you know like time seems linear but you know as you get away from the planet time that doesn't work right right it breaks down the speed of light is a is a hard limit is there a way to to go past it you know we they talk about string theory in multiple dimensions yes is there a way we talk about the multiverse to make marvel movies or whatever you know is there what would it take what would that mean right because we seize on things like wormholes we, we we have limited information we make up all kinds of stuff because we want to break out of whatever it is that we're in and we want to see we want to pierce the veil and see what's happening over there right i mean like as far as like, I mean, I was just listening to a podcast about the fact that they, these UAPs now, mm -hmm. that these pilots are like, yo, uh, we saw this thing. And, and, and the government says, yeah, we saw it. We don't know what, it, we don't know what it is. We don't know what they are. We don't know what they are. Right. The, the, the supposed Tic Tacs that fly like, like no human being could, could withstand the G forces. Right. Right. But the one thing is they're not attacking. Right. It's, they're not they're not attacking right it would be a different scenario it's like the tic tac just blew up st louis oh shit <laughs> you know if the tic tac stopped blowing stuff up right, right, right. then then we you know that, as it is now that's another thing that topic people get very religious about that topic oh, people sure. have like found meaning in that thinking that there's like other civilizations that are here watching over us or they're here with us yeah and people get very very they re replace god with aliens well this is what's happened this is part of the impulse this is part of the impulse it's of human nature that's going with the the with the large language models because we hear chat chat gpt4 and really 
we kind of want, well, what's chat GPT-6 going to be like? But there's a part of us that goes, you know what? You don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. You really don't want to have chat GPT-6. Because at a certain point, maybe chat GPT-6, <clears throat> um, maybe it's not going to call us, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to know us and remember us and be able to, you know. And, and once we have a situation where it, it talks to us, anytime we engage it, mm -hmm. it, it becomes personal. That's when the addiction and the and the right. and the and the depend dependency, mm. the dependency, like, like, ChatGPT six is not going to need robots. It has us. <laughs> it has us. And if we and if it's talking to us and addressing us and in a way that we anthropomorphize it and make it personal, then I mean, then man. Yeah, that's 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 a problem because, well, will it be in the? Is it totally independent, out of our control? Is it influenceable? Because there are people that would love to get it and do whatever mischief they want to yeah. do, and that's and that's the thing. We're we're doing it. We are doing it, and we're pushing that button, and we're gonna push the button. Yes, and I, you know, one of my biggest hopes for this thing is that we will it will somehow enable us to see intentions in people mm. you know and that's like the worst the worst part of people is like people with bad intentions you know yeah. they, they could be extremely talented extremely smart be able to develop some sort of insane technology but with bad intentions so if sure. you could if you could meet somebody and talk to them and know like this guy wants to fuck me over and fucking steal my wallet or this guy actually like is a genuine human being who wants to make a connection with mm -hmm. me and we, we, he want, we want to help each other. I think that that is a very hopeful, uh, I'm very hopeful about things like that, being it's, able to see people's intentions. Well, the thing is, I mean, this is the thing about GPT or whatever chat model as a tool. You know, there's, there's that, that would be great. But you have to understand that the person that that's, has a certain psychopathy. Mm -hmm. Their chat, they're gonna say to their chat, you know, man, I, I need to be smoother. How can I be smoother? How can I? Because right. that just could be coaching. So, well, you know, whenever you lie, you, you whenever you lie, you do this thing with your head. Liars you need to not do that, right. right? Right. So the other thing is that on the other side, you want it's gonna be kind of spy versus spy. It's gonna be. Yeah. It's gonna suddenly be. Like your AI is going to be dealing with another AI. Right. That's what's happening with that's what's happening with kids using Chat GPT for to cheat. You right. know, because it's writing in a, in a very structured way. Well, the thing about it, if you've done any kind of writing, AI. if you've done any kind of writing or anything with it, and it's and it's you know it's it's almost it's just like using an amp modeler. There's a character to it. Like if you list, if you worked with um, a fractal, or uh, line six, or Kemper, there's a certain I don't know how to put it. There's a certain character, even though it's even though it's uh, profiling an amp. There's a certain character that it has. It's not a bad thing. It's just that things. Oh, yeah. That you go. Okay, maybe it's. A, a, how it handles the presence or the reverb, but say, you know what? That sounds like a that sounds like a Kemper, and it can be and and, it, and, and, and the, sometimes the profiles are. I have a Kemper and and have access to all these different profiles. Some of the profiles are done really well, and some of the profiles don't sound that great. Mm. They 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 just don't sound that great. But the ones that sound good sound really good. Mm. But there's a kind of aspect to it that you'll be able to hear like writing is a very can be very technical so you see technical boring writing those people with those jobs they're in a problem because technical boring writing chat gpt4 can do that like yeah. you know like ridiculous like just like technical right. boom 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 writing yeah. the boring stuff if you're talking about creative writing and that's where the that's funny because like i actually you know, I've subscribed to Chat GPT four, and I interact with it to do certain things. 
What is it? It's like a hundred bucks a month or a hundred bucks a year. What is no, it? No, it's what like a, it's, I think it's about a hundred bucks a year. Okay. You know, I but, but the thing, it, yeah. but the thing, the thing about it is, is that if you do it, if you do, you can do it for free, but if you go right. for free, you, you could be, you can wait for a long time. You could not actually get in for a while. If you pay, subscribe to it, you get in right away. Right. You can leave it on on your desktop and thus interact with it whenever you, you know, it really mm. prioritizes that you get to play with it. Right. I've done some things with it and and I've actually done things 3.5 or 4. And I, it's interesting because 4 is more advanced, but I had a story idea and I gave it a title. And the earlier version, I liked something that the earlier version did that the later version didn't do. It 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 kind of went right to the point of the idea. And then the more advanced version kind of did this thing that was like it was kind of it gave it was too much exposition. It did a little too much expository stuff. And I thought, "Wow, that's so interesting cuz you're more advanced than this other version, but I liked what the other version did better." Mm-hmm. Which which I was surprised that I would prefer something that an earlier version did. But this is creative, it's not supposed to be accurate, it's like more. And then, after a while, you know, you see certain, you know, you I would wind up saying, no man, don't do, man, don't, don't do that, because don't, don't, you know, like if you have a prompt, it'll kinda, it's like they say when you're being interviewed, put the question in your answer. You know, it's like you ask me a question. I say, well, the reason I blah, 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 blah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you don't have to hear the person ask the question. But, but I don't want to. I, yeah. So when it when I ask it to do, if I give it time, I don't want you. I, if I describe the story to it, I go, don't put the description of the story in the story. That's whack. Mm. Right. Don't put the description. Don't do. You know, so it's weird. Like it has its it has its limitations. It really does. Mm. And if you work with it for a while, you go, oh, man, you know, it's th- there's a certain thing that it does. And you go, OK, yeah, it's doing that thing. Mm-hmm. So interestingly enough, that's why using it to create content is funny because you really have to. You, you're still involved. You yeah. still have to be involved with it because it'll just do a generic, it'll do, It'll go right to just doing something so totally generic. Right, but you gotta give it the inputs. It's like a different way yes. of being creative. You still gotta be creative, but you gotta think, you gotta almost like reverse it. There was a photographer who, a uh, British photographer who won a traditional black and white photography contest with a completely AI generated um, image. And they interviewed him and it was so interesting because he's a traditional photographer and he's an older gentleman and he was kind of like, man, I love it, this is great. And he, and, he, and he won this contest and he didn't take the prize money. He said, well, I won the contest but they didn't want it done. But he was still enthusiastic about it. And the interviewer said, so, so, so what is it that you're doing? And he said something so brilliant and I went right with it. He said, well, I'm, I'm a promptographer. Wow. He said, I'm a promptographer. Promptographer. So the whole image, the, it did not come out of a camera or right. the real world. And, and, but the thing is, the reason it won is because he knows lighting. He he described yeah. the exact lighting. Oh, wow. He described he described the, the photo. He described the film. He described the lens that I want to shot with. He he literally when he prompted it he because he's a photographer professional he asked it to do all of these nuanced things so when you see the image the image it's 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 like um it, it's like a, a image of two women and one it look it's like a younger woman and an older woman maybe you can find it Michael yeah he, yeah he won yeah look for the what's his name you remember his name I can't remember his name but he he won uh black and white he won a, tr- a traditional that's the image right there. See, that that's, one? That's the image. Wow. That looks like a real photograph. Okay, yeah, it kind of does look like a painting, though. You can see, like, in the hands. Well, it looks well like the other little... hand, well, the problem is not, it's the hand that's on um, the other shoulder. What the, yeah, the, like the, the le- gap left between shoulder. your finger. Yeah, that feels, but, you know, a lot, one of the big flaws with um, with AI imaging 
is hands. The hands are oftentimes are off. Mm-hmm. But the emotion, the way, you know, the, it looks like an old, a weathered photograph. Yeah. And, and, um, it's even got like a weird, like lens flare in there. Yeah. Like in, yeah. Imperfections yeah. in there that yeah. you would think it's it would br- be part it's of brilliant. the photo. It's really brilliant. And the thing is, where he, he was the one who, as far as I know, well, I'm, I'm sure it was around before, but he said, you know, I'm a promptographer. And I was like, man, that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. That is brilliant because it's a different, it's another kind of expression. It's a new kind of expression. I, I added promptographer to, 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 yeah, to my thing, photographer great. and promptographer. That's incredible. And me, multimedia, you know? Uh, it's just so, but he, but the thing is, part of the reason why this photo worked so well is because he meticulously described the lighting des- described the lighting mm. and uh described you know in the in his prompt for the image so that's how it was able to come out and and people how do you even describe that light? like that's a, that's amazing to me how you could even well it's like it's also it's like kind of it's very much like a f- image from like the 1930s right right it seems like it's a, f- a photo uh, you know, uh, you know, it's an a, it's a photograph from the about the 1930s, I would say. Yeah. And uh, you know, and it, and it's, um, yeah. The only thing, I mean, the the only thing is the uh, the left hand, the yeah, the, the left awesome. hand on the shoulder is is that's the that's where that's the only um, the right hand is the right hand on her shoulder is, is fine mm. and the difference between her you know the hand of the younger woman and the hand of her mom or aunt or whoever she's supposed to be you know and it's the it's the positioning of the uh the left hand that's mm. problematic right but they didn't but but they didn't pick up on it they went they went for it that's so interesting man yeah so yeah, so promptography is here, and 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 the next thing, and and this is where the freak out, the freak out will really come out, is when, in the image space, when when video, yeah, when you can describe video and describe, I want a stop motion right. of a coffee cup going across the thing and I want the table to be I want the table to be made out of teak and mm-hmm. I want and I want there to be a follow spot when the coffee cup goes across when that happens I mean it's already ha- like the deep fake thing shit is so con- convincing already it hasn't been able to do it hasn't they haven't been able to do frame by frame but that's right. the thing but given enough computing power the idea is like I want this thing. I make the image, and now I want the image to move. Mm. Once that happens, and that to me is the next God. frontier. So when that happens, and you'll be able to say, "I want it shot with a red camera," or "I want it shot with this," or "I want it shot with a film camera," I want to stop right. motion, and I want it da 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 da, and you're mm. able to do that, and that can actually go down. We were in the, the 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 whole. What happens to society? Like the people that, that are able to that want to manipulate society. Like I think of the people that control. Like the people that are in government or the people that are part of these, you know, people like uh, that have control of Twitter. Like with the, these recent Twitter files, where you see like the FBI is working directly with Twitter and the CIA is working directly with Twitter. And like, if they want to do anything to help people get elected or whatever their motives could be. They could easily manipulate our population because everybody is on Twitter and mm-hmm. everybody is seeing this stuff. And like, who knows what's real? So the thing is, there's a, there's a, there's a place it has to go to first. There's a place it has to go. See, this is like, oh, the image. Okay. So there's a place it has to go to. Because you think they would get a hold of it before anybody. That's what, that's what. Well, they're not creative me. people. You know what I mean? They're not creative people. The thing is, the, the the place where it's the most interesting and the most troubling. I mean, my artist friends, half of them are they are. There's a big lawsuit now because that copyright copywritten images are used to train um, some for not not all of them, but some of the um, the uh, AI image makers. You know, they've used a lot of copywritten images. Oh, okay. And have them manipulated. Yeah, and, and, right. And, and right. So what was interesting is, it, interestingly enough, uh, the Smithsonian just released a ton of images to the public domain. 
The Smithsonian just did a like wow. has there's a ton of technical images and historical photographs. There's a whole trove that is now available from the Smithsonian, the national wow. from the National Archives. And I would imagine that since these images have been released to the public domain, that those images will be used for um, model, for, you know, to train, to be legitimately used mm -hmm. to train the AI without any copyright infringement problems, particularly with photography, right? Since this stuff is being released to the public domain, mm -hmm. it's being released to the public domain right. that using the public, this a trove of public domain images to train AI image makers is going to be very interesting. And there are a lot of old film. So this, that's been released. So I'm wondering to what degree that's going to be taken advantage of by the AI modeling folks, you know, to kind of get it away from the problems of, of using artist copywritten image, images. And then... Again, to go for, to be able to go frame by because they, there isn't that yet. But mm -hmm. the day that there's a program or a, an app that lets you describe a scene, even if the scene's twenty, you're, you're limited to twenty seconds. Mm -hmm. That's a revolution. If you could describe, if you could literally describe what you want and have the AI image generator create a short film strip, then we're in. Then the, this whole conversation is gonna be kicked into another orbit. Right. Absolutely. I agree. Wow, man. The, catch, the ketchup's not going back in the bottle. No, you're not gonna get it back in the bottle, that's for sure. You know, and so, I mean, there's a certain amount of, of ethics. I don't know how the lawmakers are gonna, you know, uh, how they're gonna be able to wrap their arms around it. And also, I don't necessarily want it to be super restrictive, but we have to be aware that there's stuff possible that is not good. There's, there's some stuff that's, there's a lot of great stuff that's gonna come out of it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of great, un, you know, unintended consequences don't necessarily have to be bad. We have a lot of positive unintended consequences as well. Mm -hmm. But there's things that are gonna come out of all of this that we, 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 we ain't thinking about it. We're not thinking about it. Right. And we can't, we can't, we don't know what it's going to be because people are going to people are going to be clever, and the person that could turn it just forty five degrees, you know, that person could be incredible or they could be a problem. Right. What is your day to day life like? How much time do you spend worrying about this stuff? Oh, well, how much know, time do you spend? Well, are you still like making music every course, day? Yeah, what do you? What do you? What is I your... play, well, well, you know, I'm playing with living color. I just we just did. Uh, we're just in. We were just in Memphis. We played okay. uh, the big Bill Street. Um, festival mm -hmm. and uh, the very next day I went to Sam Phillips recording and um, I produced a session um, uh, a friend of mine Adam Rubenstein is making a film about the Barquets and the Barquets were this band that they were in the plane with Otis Redding when uh, Otis Redding uh, that plane terrible plane crash in 67 oh, okay, yeah. right they were really young they were really young and they were kind of his band for his, you know, for his last, uh, in fact, it was, the crash was in Michigan. So there's one, there's a surviving member, the bass player, James Alexander. And he, we did, a, they had this big tune in 67, Soul Finger. It's this really cool instrumental thing. And it's really cool tune. And, and I produced a version of it for the film, for the documentary film. Oh, that's amazing. And, and Adam Rubenstein, his... Uh, cousin uh Ro Ro ronnie caldwell ronnie caldwell was the keyboard player for the bar case and he was the one white member of the bar case and he found out from his mom oh that's you know that guy that's your cousin and he went you know and then you know kind of adam went down this kind of rabbit hole and and he's making it's a, it's a it's gonna be a great film i think it's i am convinced because i've seen like a kind of trailer for it mm-hmm and it's so good. I mean, because all the all the people that were connected to them, all these people that knew these kids, they were like 16, 17 years old, you know? And when Otis Redding heard them, he just fell in love with them, and they said, these guys gotta be my band. And you gotta remember, he was just in his 20s. Right, right. right. You know? So 
it's uh it was just a very cool thing and i'm I'm a talking head in the documentary and in the oh, course okay. of in the course of making the documentary, I said, you know what you should think about doing uh a a version of soul finger for the a new version of soul finger for the documentary and it just so happened that uh, he was making some interviews and then living color we were going to be down there so i stayed an extra day mm. and um mono neon uh incredible lefty bass player he's uh he's he's you could you should check out mono neon's videos on, okay. on youtube he's out of control he's out of control he's like he's like bootsy collins 2.0 if you took bootsy and Jocko, like he's crazy, he's crazy town. Wow. And, and you, won't, you won't be able to mistake Mono Neon because his fashion, he's like a young fashion icon, he's incredible. Wow. He's from Memphis and uh, and and the Barquets meant a lot to him, so, so, so he's on this track as well. So James Alexander, who's the last surviving member of the Barquets, bass player, mm -hmm. is on this track with Mono Neon. Wow. Who's like Mr. Tomorrow on bass, and the, and a bunch of uh, kids from the Stax uh, Music Institute also played on the track. So, so I did that, and uh, I'm super, I'm proud of it, and I'm really happy, and I can't wait to hear it mixed. And and we recorded it, we recorded it on a board. This is the opposite of tech and AI. We recorded on a board that was uh, in the uh, Stax uh, B room. At Sanfield, and this is this is an old analog board. It sounds fantastic, and uh, and a lot of records were cut on this board. So wow, it was really, really, really special. And then uh, upcoming this summer, you know, Living Color and the band Extreme, we're going out and doing shows, uh, going out on tour. And uh, I thought I wrote a note. We're also gonna we're here in Florida, and we're gonna be at Disney. Um, from six twenty nine to the second. Oh of no July. way! Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so, incredible. Yeah. So we're gonna be we're gonna be living color. We're gonna do a, a little stand at for Disney. So what is what is your like range when it comes to like new music you'll listen to or experiment with? Like, do you listen to new stuff that comes out? How many different genres do you dive into? I'm a nut. I'm one of the, I'm one of those guys. Like, I wish. I was able to experiment with new music. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, I'm kind of like the nostalgic type person where I kind of go back to the things that I grew up listening right, to. Or like, right. it's rare that I'll really like dive into some new album from some new band that I I rarely, like a, you mentioned you listened to the, you were listening to the new Tool, Tool album a couple of years ago. I saw you on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, fantastic. And I was like, I listened to Tool a couple of times in high school, but like I never d dove back into it, but I know I would fucking love Tool. Oh, so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inoculum. In, yeah, that, that record is good. And uh, I don't know, man, it's, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm hearing people, my daughter turns me on to a lot of things. Really? Like, I, like uh, her. You know, H E R. The R, she's uh, she's H period E period R period her. Okay. R and B artist, crypto badass guitar player too. She's really? great. She's she's like she's kind of extraordinary because she's a singer songwriter, but she's a multi instrumentalist. And there's a there's actually a clip of her playing on Saturday Night Live. And I think in the second song, she breaks out a guitar and she's wail, kind of wailing. I was like, Whoa, what's up? Wow. <laughs> yeah, really talented. Badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th that's, a good, that's a good thing. You know, you're too young to have a 19-year-old, but... <laughs> yeah, I am a little bit too young. My <laughs> oldest is four. <laughs> well, you know what? Your kid's going to connect, keep you connected. Mm -hmm. to Keep you connected to, uh, to new music. You know, yeah. it's, it's funny. There's an artist named Steve Lacey who's a guitar player, right? But it's it's over. My daughter is a huge Steve Lacey fan, kind of proto princey, but but really cool tunes. Mm -hmm. Plays guitar, but <laughs> when she said Steve Lacey, I was like, you mean the jazz saxophonist? Because there's this very famous in the jazz circles play soprano saxophone named, oh, no way. named Steve okay. also named Steve Lacey I was like what you talking about Steve Lacey what you know <laughs> and it's a totally different that's person hilarious. yeah 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 so so it's uh yeah man it's uh you know man and and I like heavy things I like melodic things I like weird things I, mm -hmm. there's a band one of the heavy bands the two bands that are kind of heavy is that thank you scientist insane it's a very prog very, 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 very prog band, and they're out of control. 
And uh, what does that what does that mean, Prague? Prague, you know, kind of a uh, lot of parts, pretty complicated. Okay, you know. And there's another band called Car Bomb. <laughs> Car Bomb. I feel like I've heard of that. Car Bomb, super heavy, and 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 kind of insane. And and I kind of kind of like them. So I, I go from her to Car Bomb. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? you got a wide variety. Yeah, a wide wide variety of things that I uh, like, and I like old older music. Mm-hmm. I, you know, obviously I, I love the uh, working on the bar case thing. So I try to stay. I mean, I'm I just dig it. It's not even trying to stay. I just dig it. You know, it's like, right. I dig it. I dig it. I dig it. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you again for coming on here. Oh, I really man, appreciate thank you that. For having me. We planned on an hour. We did over two hours. Um, tell people where they can follow you and find out what you're doing. You can find I'm Vert. I'm Vert twenty two on Instagram. I'm Vert twenty two on Twitter. I'm Vernon Reed on Facebook. I am Vert twenty two on Mastodon. Also a great band, but it's an emerging. Oh, I love Mastodon. Yeah, but emerging social network. There's a new one, but Mastodon the band is like you know, crack the sky, fantastic. Yes. And uh, and what else? I'm 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 I think I'm gonna mess with Blue Sky. I, you know, Blue Sky's just come out. You know, so this, but I'm Vert V U R N T two two. That's me. Cool, man. I'll make sure I link it all below for everyone who's uh, watching and wants to follow. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. Good night, world. Peace.